to start with questions here in Houston, then we'll go down to the Kennedy Space Center, and then we'll go to the phone lines. We have quite a number of people, so we're asking that you stay with uh, one question, one follow-up, and we'll come back here and go back around one more time. We'll start off with Mark. Thanks. Uh, Mark Corot for Aviation Week and Space Technology. And um, I wanted to go back to the uh, software uh, validation work. Could you elaborate some on that? And um, if I understood correctly, you'll have a follow-on to this FRR on about the 23rd. If you could sort of bridge what happens after that to the launch point. I can do piece of it and then, then Mike and the others can also chime in. There's still some software work that's that's going on. Uh, some activities are completing in Hawthorne where they're doing hardware in a loop testing uh, to make sure that the software works right with the hardware. Then when they complete those results, they provide test reports and test analysis of that activity back to the NASA team. And the NASA team looks at that to make sure that it all fits and works the way it was supposed to go work. They'll also do some testing with the actual vehicle down in Florida. Well, they'll do the same kind of thing. Well, they actually run through the software with the flight vehicle. And again, those reports come back to the NASA team. We'll take a look at it. We will not do a formal review like we did today of that activity. What we'll do is we think that'll all be OK, but we'll get a report back from the individual teams, the safety folks, the software folks, et cetera. They'll tell us on the 23rd that everything went as planned. There were no surprises, nothing unique there. And then we'll just continue on then towards the launch. And, and some of the activities that occur towards the launches, there'll be a, a flight readiness firing of the engines. Uh, there'll be hydrazine loading in the Dragon capsule. A lot of activities occur in that in kind of that final week. SpaceX also does their own internal flight readiness review, and they'll do that on Sunday, the 22nd, just in front of this review. So that'll be one chance for them to go through to make sure all their individual components and systems are ready to, to go forward. So I would say today we had enough assurance that everything is moving in the right direction. We're heading towards the 30th. We're not completely there. We want to go ahead and get these final checks from the SpaceX team. After those checks are complete and we understand where they all sit, then we'll, we'll say collectively this is the, the right thing to head forward. So we got enough assurance today that the 30th is the right day to head towards, but we still reserve the right to take a look at the day to see what the software does and see what the teams find as they go do a more in-depth review. Eric Berger with the Houston Chronicle. A quick question for Alan, then a follow-up for uh, Elon. First of all, Alan, is it accurate to say that NASA has invested $381 million so far in the commercial cargo capabilities for SpaceX? Yes, that is the total of the 37 milestone payments we've made to SpaceX to date. Okay. And then for Elon, you're in Texas today, and it's possible that Dragons could launch from Texas in the future. I'm curious what the state and maybe the federal congressional officials need to do to make this an attractive place for you to build a spaceport? <laughs> um, but I, I don't want us to get too, too off topic, because um, I mean, this is really about the upcoming mission to the space station. Um, but, but we are um, pretty interested in, in the possibility of, of, a, of a, launch, a Texas space launch site. Um, and uh, I, th I think there's um, a, lot, a lot of good action being taken by the um, local authorities in the Brownsville area in particular. Um, n n not that much at the state level. We'd certainly appreciate more, more help at the state level. Um, and, uh, and then at the federal level, it's not really, you know, I think the federal level is relatively different as to what, what state we, we launch from. Um, but we thought it was important to look at having a, a third launch site just to make sure in the future that uh, if we have um, a lot of missions taking place, for you know, commercial satellite launches, uh, as well as la launches to the space station for cargo and potentially crew, um, and and then potentially de defense department missions, that, that we didn't encounter a, a, a launch site constraint. Uh, but I, I should point out also that, that we're also looking at um, potentially using one of the the, the shuttle pads uh, at at the Cape uh, for for crewed flight. So um, we just want to make sure that 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 we don't in the future encounter uh, launch site constraints. That's, that's really what we're after with, with that element. So. Hi, Kevin Quinn with KTRK ABC 13 here in Houston. Um, can, and maybe this is a question for, for Elon. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a NASA question. But can you describe, please, specifically weather restrictions that could affect launch and how those uh, would compare, say, to that which uh, was out there for the shuttle program? Are, there, are these tighter restrictions? Or are there lesser restrictions? I think they're probably comparable. Um, 
we, we, are, we definitely want to err on the side of caution, particularly since the, these are initial flights. But I, I think they're probably comparable. I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely certain, but I think you know, similar. And I think I would say they're, they're, they're pretty compatible. We've, you see it even in our expendable launch vehicles. We have a lot of trigger lightning rules. Those rules will be the same. We have basically the same visibility rules for the ground observers that are watching the rocket fly, those kind of things. So those are all pretty similar. The winds aloft might have been a little more restrictive for shuttle than, than they are for uh, the, the Falcon 9. But, but other than that, I think they're, they're pretty comparable overall. Thank you. Jeremy. Jeremy Diesel from KHOU. Um, question for Elon. If this is all successful, everything goes exactly as planned. Huh, that would be awesome. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what becomes the next step, the next timeline, the possibility of seeing a crewed flight? Um, well, um, you know, the, assuming this is successful, then, then we look forward to a, st a steady stream of cargo flights to, to the space station um, uh, under our CRS contract. Um, that would be really super great. Um, and then, uh, you know, be because we've designed the spacecraft and rocket to be very similar between crew and cargo, you know, we're in the process, we'll be accumulating a lot of knowledge about how, um, you know, how a potential crewed flight might work. And if, if there is an issue, I think there's, you know, a good chance we'd uncover it on a, on, a, on a cargo flight rather than potentially put crew at risk, which is, I think, pretty helpful. Um, and, and then we do have to have a separate contract with NASA for, you know, adding in the elements necessary for for crew transport, um, and then there's, uh, uh, yeah, but there there are, there are a bunch of additional steps that have to take place there, um, but we're we're optimistic that that at some point Dragon will be carrying astronauts, and that would be really great. Two years, three years, five years, <laughs> eight years. Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of variables between here and there. Um, Perfect world. Oh, perfect world. Uh, well, it's probably like three years. Maybe a little less than three years. Yeah. Two and a half. Yeah. Okay. David. David Hirsch, NHK from Mr. Suffordini first. In the, given that the ISS is an international collaboration, I wonder if you could give us a sense of what the importance of the international partnership as, as far as this entire project and the role of international partners in the FOR today. Yeah, it's twofold. One is um, uh, the partnership, the entire partnership does benefit from these vehicles and, and uh, in fact all but our Russian colleagues rely on it. Uh, we utilize a, a suite of, of vehicles in the futures to, uh, to provide uh, up mass uh, to ISS and its progress, the, the JAXA HTV, the ESA ATV and then the two commercial vehicles that we're talking about here today. And the lion's share of the upmass will be provided for the USOS segment. The lion's share of the upmass will be provided by these commercial vehicles. So it's very important to the, the partnership. Um, this FR, just like every FR, has all the partner agencies are represented, and so it's important to them. Um, and they worry about not only the fact will it bring it up, but there are safety implications. There's plume impingement issues. There's uh, EMI. There's all sorts of things that we have to prove. Um, to the entire partnership that we meet those requirements. And all of our requirements are meant to protect us uh, from that. And our partners uh, per participate in the, in the safety review boards and the, and the analytical process of determining that, we, that we're not causing um, uh, any harm to the rest of the spacecraft. And in fact, uh, the part of the responsibility of the U.S. is to sh ensure the integrated spacecraft is okay but um, they would like to see the data, and so we provide the data that's necessary to make them feel comfortable that their element uh, is also safe from those aspects. Down here? No question? Okay, let's come over here. Hi, um, my name is Ken Skiobara from NHK. I hope I can make myself understandable in English, but I would like to ask a question to Mr. Kirsten Meyer and Mr. Musk. Um, everything pretty much seems familiar for a reporter reporting for HTV, and I would really like to ask, um, what is the connection between um, this new challenge of SpaceX with the Japanese HTV approach and rendezvous docking? In other words, was there any improvements or what kind of implications have you had added to this approach for S SpaceX? And to Mr. Musk, is um, I think pro um, safety is the priority, but as a commercial company, what kind of aims have you tried to implicate into 
SpaceX's new launch vehicle, and um, how would this um, challenge, this new challenge, would, um, uh, in a sense, um, uh, add to your uh, overall, I would say, um, uh, pursuit for that aim, if possible? Yes, uh, first of all, for your first question, I think we learned a lot from the uh, HTV activities. We did a very similar approach when HTV flew the first time. Um, it flew up and it did a series of gates, very similar to what Holly described in, in a lot of detail here earlier. So those same kind of approach where we verify a capability before we commit to using that capability, that was done with the, the HTV. And it was a good chance to see how that process worked, how it worked as a team. Uh, I would say also Holly's team and the, the flight controllers, they got familiar with uh, getting that data from a from an international partner in the case of uh, JAXA. Uh, they took that information, they could then digest it, analyze it, compare it, and, and work with them. So I think working with the international partners gave us a lot of experience of working with a, a different community that we don't work with every day that allowed us to, to learn how to exchange data back and forth, how to communicate, and how to develop the basic procedure that allows us to, to learn incrementally, that allows us to get into the birthing box to be picked up with the, uh, with the SSRMS. And I think also that the birthing box concept and using the SSRMS to pick up uh, the dragon, that's very similar to what we did with HTV. And again, that HTV kind of paved the way of, of seeing how the crew would use the arm, the overlays they use, the camera ops they use. A lot of that was kind of proven the first time through with the HTV flights that are coming up. So we learned a lot from our international partners and we applied it to the commercial sector and to Dragon. And it, and it made it a lot easier when we come into this flight. It wasn't. Uh, the first time around we've seen this stuff, we've seen the basic process and procedure, although the vehicle is, is very different than, than the Japanese uh, transfer vehicle. Right. Um, as soon as I, I think uh, we're, we're um, great, grateful for the prior work of HTV as well, you know, because it, it made things easier for SpaceX to, you know, um, approach the space station because of some similarities in, in the way things are done. So that, that, was, very, that was quite helpful. The, the way in which Dragon is, is most significantly different is that it returns to Earth, um, it, well, rather intact. <laughs> and, you know, it's got a heat shield and everything, so you can return cargo to Earth. So that, that's probably the biggest difference. Um, and uh, the, the uh, I, I touched on this briefly earlier, but um, because of that, there's so many similarities between the cargo version of Dragon and the crew version of Dragon. We, we're learning a great deal about uh, crew transport when we do a cargo mission. Um, I mean, technically, if you've got a little oxygen bottle um, you could, and you stow it away on Dragon, uh, you, in theory, be OK. You could go to the space station if you're tucked away in there. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of neat in that respect. And, and come back, too. <laughs> um, so um, and, and then. You know, there's, there's sort of a larger context of, of SpaceX where we want to keep um, up, keep upgrading the technology um, and making improvements uh, so that uh, ultimately um, that there can be journeys beyond the space station. It would, so that's uh, that, 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 that's obviously a topic for another day, but I think there's a lot of excitement about that, and we're going to keep improving the, the Dragon technology. Um, so we have we have an upgrade plan and everything. So. Okay, I think that's it from here for now. Let's go down to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and take questions from there. Uh, hello, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press with a question for Mr. Musk. Um, there's still a fair number of people not totally on board with commercial, the commercial side, especially regarding crew transport. And I'm wondering if you, you feel a lot of pressure as you go into this last two weeks before launch to succeed and how important is it in your mind to launch successfully into birth on this flight? Well, it, there's, there's no question that uh, there's, there's going to be um, some people who will put, I think, too much weight on this flight because it is explicitly a test flight. And um, it, indeed, it, 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 we may not succeed in getting all the way to the space station, as I um, articulated earlier. Um, but, but I think it would be a mistake to put too much weight on this flight because there are uh, hopefully going to be two more flights later this year to the space station, which will be um, almost identical configuration. So if this one um, doesn't succeed in getting to the space station, I'm, I'm confident that one of the other two will. And um, you know, we'll work with NASA to resolve any issues and, and uh, 
uh, and, and then and, you know, figure those out and, and then get, get to the space station. Uh, but there should be no doubt about, um, about our resolve that w we will get to the space station, whether it's on this mission or on, or on a future one. Um, and um, and, I, and I, I don't think that um, if, if this mission just does, doesn't get all the way there, that it should be taken as a verdict on uh, commercial crew transport. Um, I think that would, that would be, that would just wouldn't be right. Um, although there will be some people who, who try to do that. Thank you. And, and if this does go well, what is your timeline for those next two flights? Uh, well, that's something we have to work with NASA on. But um, you know, I think it's there'll probably be um, one in the summer and one at the end of the year. But but that that time timing remains to be uh, worked out with NASA. This is Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. I believe this is uh, for Ms. Ridings. Um, can you talk about for an April 30th launch, um, the, when would the, that, that red arrow that you talked about on the slide for the, the racetrack that you're doing, about what time after liftoff, sort of mission off time, would that begin? Okay, so for an April 30th launch, um, launch is 11.22 a.m. Uh, Central Daylight Time, and you get to the, right before the red arrow is on the order of 38, 39 hours. Uh, so if you were using uh, shuttle nomenclature, which the NASA folks uh, still do, it'd be uh, a flight day three uh, fly under. Uh, so flight day one launch, flight day two is really, we call it far field phasing, uh, flight day three fly under, so 38, 39 hours. The fly under itself is on the order of uh, three or four hours where we're gathering that data. And then uh, if you remember kind of from the red arrow all the way around, roughly 22 hours. Um, and so you're, you're coming back uh, the next day really for a, a flight day four uh, berthing, uh, rendezvous and berthing. Um, so I'll go through it one more time. Slower flight day one launch, flight day two phasing, flight day three fly under, uh, which is May 2nd in our uh, scenario. And then uh, a flight day four uh, proximity operation rendezvous and berthing, so May 3rd. Uh, the capture itself, uh, kind of early morning, uh, central daylight time, 7.30. Uh, of course, crew day, that's kind of midday crew day. Uh, so uh, the activities will start uh, pretty early in the morning. Houston time and even earlier in the morning, uh, California time. Uh, but the capture would be uh, about 7.30 a.m. Uh, in the morning is, is what it'd be planned for on that uh, May 3rd. Thanks. And uh, I believe there, if I understand this correctly, there's a, the, the, the primary opportunities on April 30th, and then uh, there's a secondary opportunity on May 3rd. Um, can somebody explain why there are not, uh, there isn't a daily launch opportunity for this mission, and is this just a mission-specific thing? Thanks. Here, yeah, so, so I'll talk about it a, a little bit. So some of it is, is mission specific uh, because of the demonstration. You know, as, as Elon talked about, uh, this is definitely the demonstration. And so there's a lot more things on this flight uh, that uh, the fly under is one of them. Uh, some of the objectives that we're performing, uh, the analysis that needs to be performed of the data that's gathered on orbit. Um, so the fly under is, is unique to this uh, demonstration uh, mission. And so uh, that uh, really kind of helps uh, figure out exactly what the launch dates are. Um, the SpaceX team's also um, reserving some, some margin um, that, that they can talk about, Elon can talk about a little bit, uh, just for contingencies. Again, it's a demonstration, and they want to make sure they've got enough margin uh, if, they, if they need it on orbit. Uh, we're also um, always working on uh, the ISS uh, trajectory. So we've got uh, Soyuz uh, flights uh, coming and going. We've got Progress flights coming and going. We've got ATV activities. Um, as was uh, articulated earlier. And so uh, the ISS trajectory is in flux as well. So when you add up all of those different components, uh, you end up with these uh, kind of uh, just smattering of launch dates in, in the early May timeframe. Uh, after the demonstration is complete and we look at all the data, uh, potentially we'll be able to, to find uh, those back-to-back -back type things that you were used to with shuttle, uh, but we've got to, to gather a bunch of data before we could get to the point where we understand that in detail. Yeah, I, I mean, I can say in future missions, there'll probably be more, more 
uh, you know, there's something closer to uh, daily opportunities. But for this mission, we, we, we want to have a really optimal um, launch. So we're minimizing the propellant usage getting to the space station. Um, and that's, that tends to occur roughly every three days. Um, so we just want to have as much propellant available in case something goes wrong and we need to um, make, make adjustments um, to the mission. Um, yeah, so that's why the three days. Hi, it's James Dean from Florida Today. And, and just following up on that topic, I wondered if, uh, I, I understand, I guess, that you have April, April 30 and <clears throat> May 3 as the, uh, the first couple of opportunities. Just wondered if you could elaborate any further on um, if there, there are any scrubs or anything like that. Um, are there any blackouts due to the range or, or uh, the Soyuz launch or any other issues? And so, you know, when, when do the opportunities fit into the rest of that schedule? So I can go ahead, I can go ahead and take that one as, as well. Uh, so there's actually a little bit of all of those things. Um, there's certainly range conflicts. There are always range conflicts. Um, there are some beta cutouts uh, in terms of a space station. There are some ground roll and constraint type cutouts where we don't want uh, a Soyuz vehicle and the Dragon vehicle uh, exactly on top of each other. We've got to make sure we get uh, one activity completed before we start uh, the next one. Uh, the Dragon uh, has some constraints as well for their recovery, uh, where at least for this uh, demonstration, they'd like to, to land in daylight to help them out with the recovery operations. Uh, so there's multiple uh, constraints on the table uh, that we need to line up in order to find a, a, an optimized uh, launch window for this demonstration mission. So the answer to your question is kind of all of the above. Okay, thanks. And then for uh, for Elon, um, this this flight, of course, uh, of course, it's not unusual for things to, to slip a little bit. But you were targeting November at one point, and then February. And just wondering, you know, what has uh, proven to be most difficult for you to get to the point where you're ready to go? Um, you know, if if any aspect of this was a surprise to you at, at how hard it was. And um, just as a slightly unrelated question, I was wondering if there are any plans to recover the first stage. Oh, uh, sure. So. <clears throat> Well, I should point out that uh, the, the, the rocket is definitely not the constraint. I mean, um, it, we, we could have launched several uh, um, rockets, Falcon 9 rockets, last year if, 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 if it had just been the rocket. Um, and it, it obviously wasn't the elements of the Dragon that have been tested before, you know, the, the Draco thrusters or the heat shield or parachutes or anything like that. Um, the, 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 the tricky part was really um, related to the proximity operations and uh, berthing system. To, um, so that there's um, the, the LIDARs, for example, um, which is kind of like laser radar, uh, thermal imagers, the, um, the communication system, making sure that we can communicate effectively with the space station, uh, with the ground, uh, and with NASA TEDRA system. Um, there were, uh, so there's, there's a lot of basically electronics, uh, new electronics on the spacecraft. And so it's the first time we're flying the, uh, the, the solar arrays uh, and the, um, um, the radiator system. So, uh, it, so the, 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 those, those are new elements to, to the mix. But the, the thing that really uh, drives the, the schedule is the, the, the software testing, um, uh, development and testing, um, and how, how that interacts with the hardware. That's where the phrase hardware in the loop testing, what that's what it refers to, is uh, how, how, when, when um, it, it, does the software always do the right thing in the right in, in, in a particular circumstance? And when you've got 18 engines and you've got um, effectively sort of six flight computers and, um, and, and a whole bunch of other systems, just a, the, 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 the test matrix of that is enormous. Um, and, and a lot of people don't, don't realize that Dragon is autonomous. I mean, it's really um, it's a robotic spaceship, um, and it's going to go and do this complicated maneuver. Where, where it's going to birth, birth with the space station. Um, it's not as though there's somebody flying it with a joystick um, or, or that there's somebody on board that can make kind of real-time corrections. Uh, Dragon is kind of make, in, is making lots of decisions all the time to optimize the probability of success. So it's, there's, quite a lot of, there's a lot of intelligence on board, on board the spacecraft. Uh, and, and all of that has to be tested thoroughly. And that's, that's the, the biggest driver of the timeline. Okay, I think that's it at the Kennedy Space Center. We're going to go to the phone lines now. Let's start off with the Washington Post and Ryan Vastag. Are you there? Yeah. 
All right. Let's try Wired Magazine with Jason uh, Parr. Yes, I don't know if this might be for Holly. Uh, early on, I was talking about some of the work that's being done or the training that was done for the crew on orbit. A lot of that took place on the ground. You said, I'm curious what sort of preparations are being done while in orbit. I mean, is there any way for them to practice any of the maneuvers? Uh, what type of, uh, I guess, what type of training is done while they're on orbit? Okay, so uh, the answer is uh, yes, there is the capability for them to practice on orbit. Uh, they practice uh, with the actual uh, robotic arm, so the SSRMS. Uh, uh, they um, do some uh, grappling practice, uh, again, sort of line up and pretend that the uh, dragon is there, and so they know exactly, uh, you know, looking out the window and looking there at their computer screens, uh, what the arm half of that equation is going to look like uh, when the dragon uh, arrives. Uh, they also have a, a simulator um, that they practice with uh, because certainly the, the robotic arm is a, is a significant resource and so uh, we do have a, a, an internal simulator that they can and practice uh, so they can do multiple runs, uh, some very complicated contingencies that we wouldn't want to um, put our uh, robotic arm in or that can't be done without the dragon actually there, uh, some abort type uh, scenarios. So again, they know exactly how uh, to react. So uh, those are their two primary methods of training. Uh, they also do uh, some scenarios where they set up all their computers and all their cameras, uh, more the familiarization uh, type training uh, to make sure they have quick reference marks, they can find all the data they need rapidly. Uh, and then they do some self-study as well. So uh, again, kind of that building block approach uh, to uh, hardware use uh, all the way to uh, the, the self-study with uh, the procedures and uh, talking to the folks on the on the ground. Well, up on the whole uh, the demonstration maneuvers and the graphic you showed with the, the dragon going from 250 to 220 and then 230, 10 meters. If any of those particular rehearsal maneuvers don't go correct the first time, is there the ability to retry the demonstration or is it sort of a one-shot uh, attempt? <laughs> Uh, so the answer is a little, a little bit of both. Um, uh, the demonstration, some of them occur, you were talking about the ones on the R bar, some of them occur um, early in the mission, uh, shortly after Dragon gets on orbit. Uh, those activities uh, will take place. The data will be gathered. It'll be uh, submitted uh, from the SpaceX team to the NASA team. Uh, certainly, if uh, we did not see uh, something uh, that everyone agreed to was acceptable, uh, the SpaceX team might have the capability to retry those as part of their phasing plan. That would be somewhat uh, dependent on uh, the margin they have before they get close to the space station. Um, if we uh, were flying under the space station and were unable to gather the data we needed, um, it could be done again, but it would require going all the way around and flying under again. Uh, but certainly uh, that would be an option if we had uh, enough propellants. Um, uh, to do that. And the ones on the R bar that you mentioned, um, the, those in order to go ahead and complete the berthing that day need to go pretty quickly. Um, so if they, uh, mostly because uh, sitting again on the R bar is not a very good place to stay for a long time in terms of your propellant usage. You use a lot of propellant uh, sitting in that uh, area holding your position underneath the space station at about 250. So if they didn't go well, um, it, it would not immediately mean the mission was over, but it would definitely mean you could not continue at that point in time. So it might be uh, that the Dragon uh, would uh, go off and potentially start another fly around and we would talk about uh, maybe coming back and trying those demonstrations again uh, the next day. So it's absolutely a gate to come on in. Um, if it uh, did not uh, go well, we would look at the consumable resources and work with the Dragon team and uh, see if there was anything we could do to potentially uh, repeat or gather additional data uh, that might help us understand uh, the problem that we'd seen the first time. Okay, Scott uh, Powers with the Orlando Sentinel. Actually, I, uh, I think my question has been resolved, but thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. Uh, Mike Wall with Space.com. Oh, yeah, hi. Um, so, so, yeah, I was interested. I mean, Elon talked a little bit about what some of the challenges were from the SpaceX side for, for this. I'm just curious, I mean, what have, what have some of the biggest challenges been for yeah, on the NASA side, since this is, is such a new mission for you guys and, and you're not responsible for the entire thing from start to finish? What 
what yeah, like what sort of difference has that made for you guys and, and sort of what are some of the the, yeah, the biggest hurdles to have overcome with this one? Well, uh, I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, to begin with, it's just getting used to the idea that we're not uh, worrying about the entire phase of the of the flight uh, is an adjustment to begin with. Um, probably the biggest difference once you once you settle on on that aspect of it, probably the biggest difference is we're verifying a system um, based on requirements we gave for performance. But in terms of developing the hardware, the design of the hardware. Uh, how uh, individual boxes are laid out, um, the design concept, the components that were used. That's n not the kind of information we have uh, access to. Um, and so it's been kind of an adjustment for our engineers to create requirements and validation steps that give you confidence in the robust uh, nature of the design that's being flown. And so that was probably the biggest adjustment that we made. Um, it's been, a, as I mentioned earlier, it's been it's been really kind of a, a fascinating um, process because you begin with this group of engineers that have been doing this business for many years um, who have gotten information passed on from, from the engineers before them that have done this job a certain way with uh, a complete uh, push towards uh, safety and mission success because each flight was uh, so very expensive um, that while safety was critical, mission success, mission success was very important. And everything from the, from the procurement of, um, of Tripoli parts uh, all, the way, all the way up to the integrated uh, performance testing of a, of a system and, and uh, how you're going to put it together and how it's going to react to anomalies, all that was something that you've, uh, you've spent many, many years uh, in your mind perfecting. And then to go sit with another company and say, this is your requirement, uh, and then have that group of very, uh, very clever uh, engineers, many of whom maybe don't know that much about space, many of them who did, uh, but all, all of them very young, have them say, well, why? And, and instead of the NASA engineer being able to say, well, this is how we did it, the question was, why do you do it that way? And so when that exchange took, took place, it was uh, quite an uh, enlightening experience for us both because once it was clear to the SpaceX engineer what it is that the NASA engineer was perfecting it, trying to protect against, then the light bulbs would come on and go, oh, okay, well, in order to solve that issue, this is how I'd do it with my design. And then the NASA guys would learn from that. And so th the biggest piece of it, I think, from my perspective, and it's, it's not a bad thing, it's just, a, it's just an adjustment, and I think actually it's been good for, for both sides, is that we've learned or we kind of had our eyes opened up to different ways of tackling uh, similar problems. And in, in that respect, it's been very beneficial. But I would tell you that, that it is an, it's an adjustment not to have the very detailed design uh, data that we're that uh, we're used to when you actually design the hardware, and we're more looking at it from a from a performance standpoint. And I would add one thing too, a little bit, is that the space station team got to see a piece of this as we put modules on board space station. Again, the international partners built to a set of our requirements, but they accommodated those requirements in a potentially different way than we did. So, in a non-maneuvering vehicle kind of standpoint, the station team got a chance to see how to work with a with a set of uh, with a partner that essentially answers the how to our requirements. And, and Mike's discussion was very good about how both teams have really learned from each other. I get a chance to kind of sit back and watch both teams learn from each other. And it's been a tremendous learning experience for both of us. I think we've learned new things on the NASA side, some things we've always done a certain way. And then when we get asked now, why do you really do that requirement, it's really forced our folks to go think about it and, and we're starting to, to kind of internalize it. Hey, there may be another way of doing some things that are better. So we've definitely learned some things from SpaceX and, and hopefully I think they've learned some things from us as we go through. So as a good partnership, you'll learn from each other and you end up with a much better product coming out the other side. Okay, how about Michael with Popular Mechanics? Hi, I wonder if someone could break down more specifically what's cargo is going to be on the flight, what, what sorts of hardware, and also are there going to be any crew provisions on there too? Well, in fact, uh, primarily it is crew provisions. Uh, we're flying uh, quite a bit of food. Uh, crew provisions, some, uh, some replacement consumable type components. 
Um, we have one uh, Nanorex uh, payload uh, that's got some, uh, it has a number of student uh, experiments on it. Um, that's the that's the lion's share of it. A lot of it is food, uh, but the majority of it is actually food and uh, crew provisions. What are the, what's the total weight again going up and then coming down again? 521 kilograms of uh, cargo up and 660 kilograms down. And the down manifest is not completely finalized. One of the things uh, that happens once you get to orbit is you sort of agree on the mass down and, and the biggest uh, drivers of that mass, knowing that once you get there, you might change that a bit. Uh, but but uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have some, uh, while we uh, kept away from putting one-of-a-kind uh, uh, orbit replacement units or, or you know, major uh, uh, components uh, on the, the ascent side, we actually did put some uh, ORUs on the return side in hopes of getting them home so we could refurbish them. They're not required. Uh, but uh, in a couple of cases, if we can get them home and refurbish them, it'll save us money because otherwise we would have had to pr procure that spare. Uh, that's certainly in our plan and our budget is to procure the spare, but, but uh, this was a chance to try to get some home and save some money. So we actually do have some, some uh, ORUs uh, coming home on the down manifest. What are ORUs? Those are the replacement uh, spare components uh, to replace uh, components on board. We have a pump a couple of multi-filtration beds uh, that were in the water processor and our, uh, our JAXA colleagues have a, uh, a, a power supply box for, uh, for their communication system on orbit that's also coming home. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, Lisa Grossman with New Scientist. Lisa? Okay, Jason Davis with Planetary Society. You had talked about some of the gates and specific checkpoints that the Dragon would be required to go through during each stage of the approach, and I just wanted to know who holds the final authority to make decisions during a contingency? Um, has that already been planned out in advance, or are there situations where a single party, either NASA or SpaceX, would have to make a decision on how to proceed? Thanks. I'll take that one. Uh, so it certainly depends on where you are in the mission. If it's very early in the flight and the launch and that far field phasing uh, where uh, the Dragon is not near the space station, uh, then it's the responsibility of, of the, the Dragon team and, and SpaceX. Uh, but once the uh, Dragon r arrives in, near the space station and, and near is kind of defined uh, by my, my graphic, it's coming up uh, about 10 kilometers below the space station. Uh, then uh, there are, um, and, and actually during the fly around, the, there are go, no, go points. Again, I defined that earlier as a, we take a poll and make sure we've got all the capabilities. And all of those go, no, go points, uh, the team here in Houston, uh, per our documentation, holds the final authority. Uh, there's also a couple other uh, cases. If we do have an abort, um, something that uh, is unexpected, uh, that the Dragon needs to, to leave the proximity of the space station, and then uh, the Dragon team can uh, figure out that issue and, and, and put the Dragon back on a trajectory uh, to potentially make another attempt. That process, um, Houston has authority over that process. And then if anything were to go uh, really unexpectedly wrong with the space station, even if the Dragon is fairly far away from us, we would exert some uh, authority in the sense of telling them we're absolutely not going to be ready for you anytime soon. Uh, so we don't want you to come up too close to us. And so uh, there's kind of the very specific predefined uh, items, again, those go-no-goes that are in our flight rule that are uh, those uh, height adjust, uh, again, the burns, the, the maneuvers the Dragon performs as it comes increasingly closer to the space station. There are those uh, points predefined as it flies around the space station and those uh, points predefined as it comes up to do the final uh, rendezvous and, and the berthing and the proximity operations. And then there's uh, those generic uh, catch-alls for uh, if something goes, goes unexpected. And all of that has uh, been discussed with the team uh, in Hawthorne and our team here in Houston and is all uh, written down in our, in our documentation that we fly with, our flight rules. Okay. Uh, Jean-Louis Centini from Agence France. How about Kelly Sheraton? Okay. 
Eric with Nature Magazine. I'll keep going. Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Maybe they got tired of the music. Ann Walters with the German Press Agency. How about Irene Klotz? Thanks, Josh. I am here. Um, I have a couple questions for Elon. The first is, including that $381 million from NASA, how much more money has SpaceX spent to get to this point in the, um, in the development? And um, overall, what do you think the odds are that this mission will be completely successful in terms of docking at station and a, a successful retrieval um, after splashdown? Um, I don't have the exact number uh, that, that SpaceX has spent, um, but, but we, ha we have raised um, several hundred million dollars in um, venture capital, the initial part of which came from me. Um, and, uh, and then there's been ongoing uh, payments for, for other milestones that, that have been achieved for NASA and for other customers. I, I think the, probably the total amount spent cumulatively would be somewhere around a billion dollars. Um, so um, that's cumulative over the life of SpaceX. Um, and, uh, and in terms of the probability of success, uh, I have some hesitation about giving, giving an exact number since there's, they're, they're pretty big, um, there's a pretty big range, I think. But um, yeah, I, 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 I personally hesitate to give, an, to, to give an exact number. But I, I mean, I think that the likelihood of, that the rocket works is is pretty good since it's worked twice before. Likelihood of the spacecraft, the, the non-birthing, or portions of the spacecraft that have been flown before working is also quite good. Um, but then there's, there's much more of a question mark around the proximity operations and, and birthing system and the uh, solar arrays, uh, which are being tested for the first time. Um, for uh, either Bill or um, Alan, um, could you just refresh my memory and um um, tell me what it would cost approximately based on, I think GAO did a report, if uh, NASA had developed a similar capability under a traditional cost plus award fee contract? Well, there were studies done that said uh, if you use our traditional modeling and our tr traditional approaches and assumptions, it could have been anywhere from four to ten times uh, higher under a traditional NASA development. Thanks very much. Good luck. Okay, thanks, Irene. Is there anybody else on the phone line that uh, did not get a chance yet or would like to ask a follow-up? Hey, Josh. Bill Harwood with CBS. Hey, Bill. Go ahead. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, two quick ones for Holly. Um, if the Atlas stays on the range where it is and if Soyuz stays where it is, which they will, um, and if SpaceX doesn't get off in those first two attempts, what, how, when would this guy slip? Uh, how far would it slip, uh, I'm assuming, after Soyuz, and it wouldn't be a way to get it in between Atlas and Soyuz. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier there's quite a few variables. Um, in general, yeah, there's a window kind of this late April, early May, which is when we've been talking about with the 30th and the 3rd and, uh, you know, potentially some, some options. I know the Atlas is in there. Um, and then uh, there's an after Soyuz window kind of in the, you know, mid to, to late May time frame. And, uh, you know, mentioned earlier a lot of the variables and all of those need to, to line up, but those are the two uh, windows that uh, are, are the high probability ones that, that we've been looking at uh, right now. All right, and one more quick one for you, and this will do it for me, Josh. Um, can you give us a little bit better sense of what sort of issues you guys have been working on the last couple of months with SpaceX? I mean, obviously they wanted to launch in February and it, it slipped a bit, and I've never heard any good details about what sort of things everybody was trying to get resolved, it took the extra time. Uh, if you could give me some sense of that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Well, I can, uh, I can certainly tell you from an operational perspective, um, a lot of the capabilities that the, the SpaceX team wanted to, to work on uh, were their mission success capabilities, uh, things that, that Elon can probably tell you were, were very important to them. Um, so when they came uh, with those capabilities, that, that obviously requires a, a joint uh, sort of review and determination. Uh, one of the, the ones we talked a lot about was uh, recovering from uh, abort-type scenarios. Um, those capabilities are, are complicated and difficult, and 
Um, we'd, we'd done some preliminary work, but we really took this extra time uh, to make sure that we've got a real solid plan uh, so that uh, we've got a, a higher probability of, of being able to work together to accomplish uh, uh, their, their primary objective, which of course is the success of the mission. And so uh, we made our uh, teams here, the operations team as well as other teams, uh, available to really talk through uh, some of those uh, items. Uh, that's my example, and, and I don't know, Elon, if you, if you have others. Uh, that's really the one we've, we've spent uh, probably the most time on in the, the operations world uh, talking about, because it's very important. We want to be able to, uh, to, to do that as a team in the event that we need that capability. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's like, like I said earlier, um, you know, it's really just about uh, the hardware loop testing and, and validation of the software. It, is that's, that, that's the the, the, the biggest driver. I mean, there were other things that were done in, in that time, but but just testing a vast amount of, of intelligence that, that's occurring in the software um, and making sure even in um, hi, highly unusual situations that the mission um, is, is successful, um, at least in the, in the simulation, that that's what's taken the most amount of time. Um, and it's, uh, it's, just, it's just a very, very complex system. OK. Thanks, Bill. Is there anybody else on the phone lines? All right, let's come back here to uh, Houston. Let's we'll start back over here with Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark Caro, uh, for Aviation Week. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm a little hazy on whether there's an MMT authority during the flight or if that is the space station, IMMT, that sort of is the big picture uh, it's, supervision. It's the space station, IMMT. Eric Berger again with the Chronicle. A quick question for uh, for Bill and Mike. Could, could one of you address the feeling inside the, the space program with this launch coming up? Because this is an American company, um, and obviously there's been a lot of heat on NASA in the last couple of years, relying on the last year relying on Russian rockets for humans, and this is a potential way out of that. Um, so, uh, is it something that, that that a lot of people are looking forward to, uh, or how, how would you characterize the mood sort of leading up to the launch? You want to do mood or do I do mood? You can, you can do mood. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, you know, uh, from our perspective, uh, what you're referring to is probably a combination of, of perceived emotions way back when, when we started down this road, because it had to do with, with getting out of the space shuttle business and getting into a commercial venture, and that probably played a little bit of the role of a misconception and, and perhaps not everybody uh, being completely behind this effort. Um, but I can tell you from a program perspective, and those are the people that I, I see and talk to every day, uh, we couldn't be more pleased with uh, what we're off to go do. And the reason is, A, it, it provides indigenous capability within the U.S. to supply the ISS, which we think is very important. It does have implications to uh, uh, to human transport again to ISS. It's commercializing, if you will, helping commercialize a low Earth orbit, which we think is a very important uh, need uh, and something that uh, that uh, NASA is responsible for. And uh, and some of us, uh, and in particular myself, believe this is a very important step for us to take in order for us to do exploration in the future. Uh, NASA needs to develop and, and or encourage a capability and help the development of a capability of the commercial capability to uh, support low Earth orbit, uh, both in terms of cargo and humans and other capabilities, robotic servicing, things like that. Uh, and NASA needs to start focusing on, uh, on human exploration beyond uh, low Earth orbit. And so uh, those of us who are looking forward to, uh, to the next step for NASA, uh, really are very excited about this next step uh, for this for the space station and we believe this is in order for space station to be successful these systems have to be there for us and uh, and so uh, we we uh, look on it very favorably and are very excited about this uh, pending launch I think I'd add just a little bit you know this is absolutely critical to space station we really need this cargo capability to be able to get to station, and the return capability that Dragon provides is, is truly unique of any one of the cargo providers, in, including the Russians and Soyuz. 
the amount of cargo we can get back with Dragon is just phenomenal from a return standpoint. So we, we absolutely need this capability for ISS, and, and we're really rooting for the teams to come through. I think it's also been encouraging to see SpaceX um, to work hard issues. You know, they had some uh, EMI, electromagnetic interference issues that they worked, and they spent some really good engineering time to resolve those issues and get them resolved. Um, they had some engine uh, delamination concerns, and again, they were very rigorous. They tested some things that maybe you didn't absolutely have to go test, but they wanted to go test them to make sure that they were right. That's really encouraging. So I can really, you know, get behind somebody that's doing that extra work to, to, to get ready to go fly. But as Elon said, this is really a tough flight. I mean, what, what we're asking them to go do on this demonstration flight is, is amazing. When you look at all those things that Holly talked about on her charts and the many hours that all this hardware has to work and, and all the software has to interact and the, the six computers and the, the 18 thrusters and all this has to work as a nice combined set to get into this precise box to be picked up by the SSRMS, that is no easy task. So this will be a very demanding mission and we need to look at it as a test flight. It's what it should be. We'll see how well that the test works out, but there was they've really done a good job in getting ready for this test. So as a NASA team, we're, we're ready to watch, participate, and help, and we, we truly need this capability for ISS. David. Yeah. And, and just to get a, a more detailed sense of where we are technically today as of this meeting, the, the hardware in the loop issue that you were describing a little early, does that relate specifically to something on the timeline that Ms. Ridings was, was taking us through earlier, a specific element there, or is that, as you're saying, maybe something that's more generalized over over the entire mission? Um, yeah, this, well, uh, so, so hardware in loop means, to give you a little more um, uh, color on that, it, it, essentially we, we have a, a complete replication of the, of the Dragon's avionics system on, on a bench. And and then it, it, it flies a simulated mission, um, and it, it actually, it, it's like a, sort of like a, like a, Brain in a tub thing. It, it actually thinks it flew to the, to the space station, and it and it does. And, and we we watch to see what it does. Does it do all the right things um, on, on the way to get there? Um, and if it doesn't, then then where did it go wrong? Um, and what happens if we unplug certain devices, essentially simulating failure at, at in you know at, at the worst possible moment? Does it does it does it then uh, take the proper steps? Um, and then what happens if you fail several simultaneous things? And what if you fail something and then and then restore it? Uh, there are many, uh, you know, it, the, the, the cross product of, of all those things is, is a huge number of, of tests. So there's there's just we're introducing failures. We'd reduce failures, yeah. So um, there's nothing along that timeline. Just to move it along, because I know it's getting late here. That in in Miss Riding's timeline, that you're specifically focused in as far as a mission element that 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 might be problematic. You you're just need to introduce more failures and troubleshoot that and see how the system's going to react. Right, I, I, exactly. In fact, the, 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 the recent, say in the last month or so, the, 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 the tougher things have been to deal with um, false aborts, where, where it actually um, initiates a mission abort um, because uh, it was too sensitive to the parameters. So it, it, things were actually okay, but Dragon got too worried and, and aborted the mission. <laughs> So, um, from LA, so you're right. It's so it's you know it's you, you, you don't want to have you, it needs to it definitely needs to abort if something's wrong. But sometimes it may think something's wrong, but it's actually okay. Um, and, and there are all sorts of, and there are all different types of, of failure. Like like I said, you can have something fail and, and stay off. You can have something fail erratically, where it, so it goes off and comes back, um, and, and and sort of oscillates. Um, you can have multiple things fail at the same time, and, and, and the, the system has to be able to deal with all of those contingencies. Okay, is that it here in Houston? Okay, before we finish up, we're going to take a look at our launch and mission coverage that we have upcoming here on NASA television. Uh, coming up at L-1, there will actually be a, a pre-flight, uh, pre-launch news conference from the Kennedy Space Center. And then on Monday, April 30th, at 10 a.m. Central Time, that is when our launch coverage will begin. And once again, launch uh, actually scheduled for 11.22 a.m. Uh, Central Time right now. And then at 1 p.m. Central Time, we'll have a post-launch news conference from KSC as well. On uh, flight day two, which right now should be Tuesday, May 1st, uh, we, will not, we will not have any live coverage here on NASA television, but we will have an update during our typical uh, daily ISS update show uh, here at JSC, which will air at 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern. And then on Wednesday, May 2nd, at 1.30 a.m. Central Time, 
very early in the morning. We'll have our fly under coverage from here at the Johnson Space Center uh, inside Mission Control Houston. And at 9 a.m. Central Time, we will have a mission status briefing here at JSE uh, as well. And then finally, Thursday, May 3rd at 1 a.m. Central Time, that is when our rendezvous and berthing coverage will begin uh, here at the Johnson Space Center, once again from Mission Control Houston. And then at noon Central Time, we should have a mission status briefing again uh, here at JSC. Of course, all these times are subject to change. To see all of this and to also see uh, any of the slides that you saw today from our participants, just log on to www.nasa.gov slash SpaceX. All lowercase, it's important that you do that. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side of the page down at the bottom, there's a media resources section. You can find all these slides as well as the press kit once we get, uh, get it uh, finished up and posted there, as well as the uh, NASA TV schedule. So just log on to there to get uh, all of the latest. I want to thank all of our participants for uh, joining us today, and uh, we'll see you back here in a couple of weeks for the SpaceX mission. Thank you.